So the, the title of the sermon this evening is, uh, is called Lost in Translation. Now you've probably heard that phrase before, lost in translation. And basically what it means is that a lot of people think that when you are converting a story or a writing or anything, that, for that matter, from one language into another, or if you're speaking with someone, trying to communicate with somebody, that things just inherently get lost in the translation, that you can't ever really completely convey what you're trying to say when you start transferring things from one language to the next, to the next, to the next. And what I'm going to preach about tonight is that's completely false. That that is not true. And people will use this as an attack on the, on the belief and the doctrine that we believe that the King James Bible is God's preserved word in the English language and that it is perfect, it is without error, and that it is equivalent to the, the, the writings of the original uh, people that penned down God's word. Right, So the words that we hold in our hands today in 2016, all of us that understand the English language, these words are, are the God, that God's word. These are the words that God has for us to know today. And they're the same words that he has given. These are the same words that he gave John, the, you know, the, the Saint John, one of the disciples. The same words that he gave Moses in the first five books of the Bible. Now, when he had given those words to Moses, Moses didn't speak English, right? Moses understood Hebrew. And when these, when these books were written down, most of the Old Testament was written in Hebrew and the New Testament generally in Greek. Okay, and these are both languages that, I, I, does anybody in here speak Hebrew or Greek fluently? Anybody? I didn't think so. I mean, I, I don't. Right? These are languages that, and especially like the, the Hebrew language, you know, there, there's, you know, we have Greek and Hebrew today. People can speak those languages. But as time goes on, languages change and evolve a little bit over time. They kind of change the syntax, like even English. If anyone's familiar with the English language, you have, and, and Forgive me, I'm not going to get every single point wrong. You have like, like early English, old English, middle English, and there's, there's ver different variations of the English language. And when you go back, like, for example, we have a, a facsimile, a copy of the 1611 King James Version. And that's still modern English. But when you look at that, how, the way it was printed in 1611, You'll see it's, it's a little bit difficult to read because a U, for example, looks like a V. So when you're reading a word that has a U in it, it looks like a V. So you're thinking, wait a minute, that's a V. But it's really, I mean, it's, it's the same letter. It's just the type that they used to, to write and to spell that letter. And um, that's a minor change. But when you go back to, like, has anyone ever, ever read the story Beowulf? That was originally written in, in Old English, I believe. And when you hear somebody speaking Old English, it sounds like a foreign language. It doesn't even sound like the language we know today. So languages can, they do change and evolve over time. And um, <coughs> obviously some languages boom and become more prevalent than others, oftentimes just based on who's leading, what's going on in the world. So for example, the Greek language, what, around Jesus' time, and that's the time of the, the Roman Empire, right? The, but the, the reason why a lot of people spoke Greek is because of the Greek Empire. You know, they, they had dominion over the whole world. And when you have such a long-lasting influence, a lot more people will learn that language because that's where the power structure is. Just like these days, you know, the United States of America is like the superpower of the world. We don't have really a global government yet, but that seems to be the goal. But the influence of the United States and because of the economy, um, you know, the, the economic factor and the business and everything else being done all over the world, you know, people are learning English all over the world as a result of the influence of the United States of America. It was the same way, you know, like I said, you go back in history, that's the way things have been. That's kind of the way languages are, that there's, there seems to be dominant languages that a lot of people know. And God seems to use these languages and I believe wholeheartedly that God has used the English language in preserving his word because he knew how, he knew in advance, he had the foresight of, the, of everything that was going to happen and booming with the United States. This is before the United States even became a, a country in the 1600s. 
and with the development of the printing press, and there's so many reasons, but I digress. I don't want to get too far into that. What I'm going to be dealing with is this issue of things being lost in translation. So one of the things I did was I just looked up the definition for translate. Okay, and it's just a common definition. It's not, not, this isn't scripture, but the Bible says to translate. The first definition that I found was to turn from one language into another or from a foreign language into one's own. Right? That's the common, that's what we would all understand to be a translation. You're basically transferring a writing or, or whatever from one language into another language. <clears throat> the number one English definition, as I just read, refers to languages. However, this is not the way that the Bible uses the word translate. It's a very similar meaning, but the Bible doesn't use the word translate when it comes to um, languages, when it comes to, to changing things from one language to another. Uh, I'll just bre real briefly, there's only a few mentions of the word translate, but in 2 Samuel 3.10, the Bible says to translate the kingdom from the house of Saul and to set up the throne of David over Israel and over Judah from Dan even to Beersheba. So there it uses the word translate as a transfer. It say, okay, when King Saul was the first king of Israel, God was taking the power from him and the kingship from him and giving it unto David. He translated the power of the kingdom from one person to the other person. So you can see how the, you know, the, the definition is basically the same thing, except you're just applying that definition to a language for translate. It's just a transfer from one to the other. But the word that the Bible uses for a, what we would know as a translation is interpret. Now, Translation and interpret aren't exactly the same thing. They're very, very, very similar. But the Bible uses the word interpret. An example of this in Ezra 4, 7. You don't have to turn there. This is verse, Ezra 4, 7 says, And in the days of Artaxerxes wrote Bishlam, Mithridath, Tabiel, and the rest of their companions unto Artaxerxes, king of Persia. And the writing of the letter was written in the Syrian tongue and interpreted in the Syrian tongue. So they wrote this letter under the king, and it was interpreted in the Syrian tongue. That's what it was given in. And um, you'll find other examples throughout the Bible, if you look up the word interpret, that that's what it's being used for. And we're going to see some of these examples as we continue on through the sermon. But an interpretation provides understanding, right? It helps you to understand these words. So when you look at an interpretation of a language, of something written in a different language, it's helping you to understand what does that mean. Right? It's not necessarily a direct translation, it's interpretation. It's saying, okay, this says X, Y, and Z in this language. Maybe a list of instructions. When you translate that with the word, we use translate, when you interpret it, it's how can you understand what this is saying in another language? And that's the interpretation that's given. That's the word that the Bible uses every time that language is concerned, is interpretation. Now, a good way to think of this for me, maybe, I don't know if it's the same for you, but I'm a computer programmer, so I kind of think of things real logically. I think of things in the terms of computers. Computer code is written by people, of course, right? People, programmers write code to get computers to do things. And people obviously are much more comfortable speaking um, a different language than what the computer understands. I'm comfortable speaking English. It's what I was brought up with. It's what I've known my whole life. So, but the problem is a computer can't understand English. I can't talk to my machine. I mean, it's getting that way now, right? Where, where you could just start talking and saying things and the computer will pick up on it. But there's a lot more that goes in behind that. There's actually a translation or an interpretation is more accurate going on from the English language to let the computer understand what you're actually telling it to do. Because the computer inherently doesn't just know English. It's not sentient. It's, a, it's not smart. It doesn't have its own smarts, right? But it is a powerful machine. It's got a processor. It, could, it can deal with, um, with things that we want to do. So when it boils down to it, all a computer really understands, if you want to even use that word because it's inanimate, it doesn't really understand anything. But the way it operates is based on ones and zeros. Inside that computer, there's a bunch of switches that just go on and off. Like you turn the light switch up, is on, down, is off, right? Just on and off, on and off. And you keep on putting all these sequences together, on, off. You go on, 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 off, 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 on, 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 you know, whatever. And it keeps on going, going, going. And that's how a computer is able to um, perform functions that we want it to do. Now, the languages that a programmer uses is real similar to English. So when I write my code, my work, 
I'm writing words that make sense to me. Now, they may not make sense to everybody who speak English, but you could at least read it in the English language and be like, oh, I could kind of see what's going on here. Okay, there's a structure to it. There's a little bit of a different grammar. So like when you, when you understand English, there's a structure for making a sentence. There's grammar, right? You have to know what an adjective and a pronoun and a verb and all these different things in order to make a sentence in English. There's the similar thing as in a computer language. That's why they're called languages because it's just another way of communicating. But you're computer, communicating with a machine. Now, the programmer needs to instruct the computer to carry out various actions and the communication happens when the programmer writes that code. The programming languages most commonly used today are very similar to, to English, but this language must be interpreted and given to the computer in a language it can understand. So the code that I write goes through another software that basically breaks it down. It's an interpreter. It's a go-between between, between me and the machine doing what it needs to do so that it can, it can get the actual commands that it'll understand. And that's the interpretation that takes place of the things that I would write. Now, of course, the Bible says that the Scripture, and this is really important to understand, too, when we look at the Bible, because a lot of people who don't believe that the Bible has been perfectly preserved and that they'll say, oh, there's errors in it. Yeah, when God gave Moses his words, they were perfect, but now we have problems with it. What they'll do is they'll just become the judge and pick and choose, well, this isn't really right. This actually means this. Or I think this means that. And they come up with all of these different meanings or variations of God's word. And just whatever they, they think might be right, they become the judge and basically ha have been the ones that will, that will just say whatever they think. I think this is what God's word says. And you won't have anything firm to, sound on, to stand on. You have no sound foundation because they'll say, oh yeah, this is just wrong. There's errors. This is incorrect. But we don't believe that. But the Bible says in 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 20, knowing this first, that no prophecy of the Scripture is of any private interpretation. Nothing in Scripture is, is up for just you just coming up with your own meaning for it. Right? It's God's Word. God has already promised to preserve His Word. A, a very good example of this is found in Psalm 12. If you want to be able to point to a Scripture to prove to somebody that God's Word is preserved, Psalm 12 is an excellent place to turn to. Psalm 12, verses 6 and 7. The Bible say the, says the words of the Lord are pure words. As silver tried in a furnace of earth, purified seven times, thou shalt keep them, O Lord. Thou shalt preserve them from this generation forever. So in this scripture, the task of preserving God's word and making sure that we have his word from generation to generation, that task is given unto God. God is responsible for making sure that his word is preserved. Now, he uses human instruments as he does today. He uses human instruments for people to get saved. Yet it's still God's word that does the saving. That's where the real power is, just as much as it's God who is the one preserving his word, just like God is the author of his word. God is the one who came up with the words of the Bible, yet he used human instruments to write it down and to transmit that word unto us. And in Psalm 12, it tells us there that, hey, God is preserving his word for us. Now, people who like to say things get lost in translation, there's two main arguments that they, they can bring up. One of them is that some things simply have no translation. Right? They'll say, well, in this language, you know, if you're converting the Bible from, say, Hebrew to English, They'll say things like, well, there is no English word for this Hebrew word, right? And that's one of their arguments. They'll say, well, there just isn't, it doesn't even exist. So how can you translate the Bible? How could you interpret the Bible and, and, and bring it into English if this doesn't even have a word? Well, this is an interesting argument. Now, I read an article recently that said there was 10 words that have no translation in English, Right? So I read this article, I'm looking at all these different words. Okay, some words, they can't translate one-to-one. -one. Like there is no exact specific word. 
But every word on that list can be explained to understand exactly what it means. You could completely get the full understanding 100% without losing anything by using a few more words. It takes maybe five words to get the same meaning across as one word just because that word alone doesn't have an exact one-to-one -one correlation of it means this word in a dictionary doesn't mean you can't say the exact same thing in another language because what are words anyways in sentences I mean you're conveying a thought you are conveying a meaning now the words are important in order to do that that's why we believe you know God's word is without error and every word of God is important because those words carry meaning in order to get the exact correct meaning you have to have the right words but the words don't have to be exactly the same in two different languages if you follow what I mean right so you don't need that dictionary definition of a one-to-one -one in order to, to relay the same exact meaning so who cares if the conveyance of the meaning takes one word or five it doesn't matter you're saying the same exact thing so I don't think that 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 argument really holds very much water well some things don't have a translation now some of the words in the Bible are transliterated and what that means is that because there was no sufficient word they have kept or or modified a word like baptism right that maybe didn't even exist in English but they've they've taken that Greek word and created an English word out of it but ascribed a meaning to it also so like it's in the Bible you'll find a few words like Passover is a great example of one Passover didn't exist in the English language until William Tyndale tra made his translation of the Bible way early on in the 1500s uh, prior, you know, about 100 years prior to the King James Version being, being completed. William Tyndale came up with this word Passover because he was trying to figure out, well, how can I translate this Hebrew word or Greek word into English? And it's, it was a struggle. It was, it was something that was difficult to, to come up with. But the word Passover completely conveys the exact meaning of those word of the word in, in Hebrew and in Greek because what it was you know obviously the Passover was the time when the children of Israel were during um, when they were in the land of Egypt and Moses was was trying to free them from Pharaoh and all the plagues came upon Pharaoh the very last plague was the angel of death was going to go through and kill all of the firstborn sons anybody who did not have the blood of the lamb over their doorposts of their house the firstborn son was going to die from that household so anybody who believed who believed God and believed Moses they went out and they, they, they killed the lamb and they put the lamb's blood over their doorposts which obviously is great symbolism showing that we're saved by the blood of the lamb that, that we're not going to die we're not going to receive that punishment of death because the lamb covers us and protects us but what in this story anywhere, anywhere, uh, any house where the blood was the angel of death would pass over that house would go to the next, you know, would, would pass over them. And that's literally what that word meant. So it was translated in English, and a new word was created. But so what? A new word's created, right? It still doesn't mean that you've lost meaning or understanding. You've just created one now that, oh, okay, great. Yeah, that's perfect. That explains perfectly. Now, I'm not fluent in Greek or in Hebrew, okay? But I don't have to be to understand the concept that the exact meanings can be conveyed from one language to another I do know Spanish I've taken four years of Spanish in high school and I've also done some extra learning on the side just just time and again so I don't completely forget it and I try to use it and, I, and I've learned some things now I'm not fluent today but I've learned enough Spanish to know that you can say whatever you want to say in Spanish as you can in English 
for all of the knowledge that I've had, nothing was like, oh wow, this is just completely different. So understanding just that concept alone doesn't require you to know the Hebrew language. But the people who did do the translations in English, they did interpretations because they were fluent and they did know the languages and they knew them very well and they were able to speak them fluently. When you could speak two languages fluently, you could understand all of the, the, the small details about the languages to be able to convey the exact proper meaning appropriately when you're, when you're speaking to one person or another and you have to translate something. You have to be someone who, who is a, a go-between to explain the meaning. And the people who translated the Bible, the, you know, the King James Bible, were all experts in various languages. And they knew them very, very well. So I would rather, because a lot of people will like to go to a dictionary or a lexicon, they'll go to Strong's Dictionary or one of these other dictionaries that say, see, look, here's what the Greek word means. And when you try to show someone something from the Bible, you, know, you may run into someone and says, whoa, wait, wait, that's not what that word actually means. And they'll say, see, look, here in the, in the dictionary, it says that this Greek word actually means this. Now, what they're doing is... It, I, and honestly, I haven't, I, I'm trying to think. I can't recall ever speaking to one person who, is, who, is, who has done that that actually knew that language that they, were, that they were saying what that Greek word means. That actually was able to speak Greek. Not one. But they all think they're really smart and these great students and they go and they dig up and I'm going to look in this dictionary. Well, the dictionary doesn't always have the right definition because oftentimes it depends on the context. And even in those dictionaries, you'll find there's multiple definitions for words. But what people like to do is pick and choose whichever one they like best. And whichever one they think seems to fit in and they're making up their own scripture. And just saying, well, I think that this is what this means. And they become the judge. And how could you even do that when you're not fluent in the language to begin with? See, I'd rather, instead of trust in my own lack of understanding of the entire Greek language because I'm not fluent in it. I'd rather trust what the translators did who were doing the interpretation and had full knowledge of, of the Greek language and the English language and when they're going to say, no, in this context and in this setting, when it uses this Greek word, here's what it means. Because they had a much more full understanding than just, they weren't just sitting around with dictionaries saying, okay, let's translate this and just continue, just open up. Well, what's the dictionary word for this one? What's the word for this one? And just going and, <laughs> and using a dictionary to do that. That's something like Google does. So if anyone, has anyone here ever used Google Translate? Now they're getting better and better, but languages are complicated. It's, it's not an easy thing to do translations. It's very difficult, and I'll give you that. It is difficult. It's not easy. It's not as simple, and that's why you'll, you'll see these translations. You know, at my, at my job, we um, do a lot of business worldwide, so customers sometimes will ask questions, and you see them come in because they're using software to try to, to, to explain it to us in English, and it's like, it's, it's funny. It's laughable when you see some of the questions that come in because it doesn't make any sense. That's a computer trying to basically use a lexicon a dictionary to say what they're trying to convey. Well, when you just go to your Greek dictionary and think that you're just going to understand this new stuff or extra meaning, it's about as dumb as putting something in Google Translate and just expecting it to be perfect and expecting it just to be right every time. It's not going to be. Now, sometimes Google Translate's right. Sometimes when you go to a Greek dictionary, it's going to say, guess what? Exactly the same thing that it already said in English. And that's what happens most of the time is someone will try to give you this extra meaning and all they do is find a synonym for the English word that's already here. Like, what's the big deal? It's, that's not any extra meaning. It, it, it says that. <coughs> but the other, the other um, argument that someone who wants to say things are lost in translation will make is the argument that, well, 
Besides some things simply not having a valid translation, they'll say errors are introduced through years of copying and translating between the languages. They'll say, see, well, this has been going on for a long time and people are copying things down. Sometimes they make mistakes and then you're converting it between all these different languages and they're trying to compile things together and maybe someone mistranslated something here and then got translated into another language and then they mistranslated, you know. But all of that argument still boils down to is God the one preserving it or is it just man? And I believe God's preserving it for us. It's his word. He's the one responsible for preserving it. And just as much, just as much as he's capable of using a man like Moses, for example, to convey his word unto us, he is just as capable. And yea, the Bible even says this is what he does. Uses, well, he has to use other human instruments to convey his word and to keep that word along. So a translator someone else doing that work, God can use them just as much as he used Moses to write it down originally. I mean, even you think about the Apostle Paul, you know, a lot of the epistles are called the Epistle of Paul to the Thessalonians, to the Colossians, to all you know, There's a lot of epistles that were, that were penned down by Paul, but you know what? They weren't really penned down by Paul. He was speaking them to someone else who was writing them. And mostly what he did was he signed with the kind of a signing off statement, you know, the Lord God bless you and keep you. Or, you know, he would say these things just so that they knew and they could see at the end that he's confirming that this letter was from him. But he didn't take the time himself to write all this down by himself. That's why one of them says, you see how large a letter I have written to you with mine own hand. Because most of the other ones, he didn't do it with his own hand. You see it in two different writing forms. Now, so what? Does that mean that, well, what Paul was speaking was God's word because he was the one that was moved by the Holy Spirit, but maybe the guy writing it down made a mistake, right? So you could say right off the bat, well, there could just be a mistake right there. Nobody had a good copy. Do you really think that's the way God operates? Do you think, do you think that, I mean, think about that. Like, it's like God's an imbecile. That, that well, I told Paul, everyone else screwed it up. Even the guy just writing it down as he was speaking just made mistakes. And that this is what's going out to the churches and going to be copied unto other churches to read and is going to propagate for people 2,000 years later to know the truth and what I have for them. But he's just going to allow the guy writing it just to make mistakes and just right from the beginning have errors. I don't believe that. That doesn't make any sense to me. That's not the God that I believe in that would just allow for those things to happen right off the bat. And if it's not going to happen right off the bat, then why would it be so hard to imagine that he's going to use people hundreds of years later to continue to preserve his word down the line so that next generation and next generation and next generation all can have access to God's perfect word. Now, I also believe that God's word is not bound to one or two particular languages, right? We're talking about lost in translation. So what some people might say is that, well, if things are lost in translation, the only way that you could fully understand God's word would be to go back to the original Greek language that was used. Not a modern variation of it. No, the old original Greek language that was spoken and the same thing with the Hebrew language, right? Now, I know there's still other writings like Aramaic and um, Syriac that, that were used where that's all we have. The manuscript evidence comes from various languages. But you'd have to learn all of those, I guess, according to some people, to order to completely understand God's word. Now, a God that made salvation so easy and so simple that all you have to do is to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. He loves us so much. He wants his word to be understood. He wants people to be saved. God's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. God wants that so much, and he made salvation so easy, but he's going to make understanding his word so difficult and that you have to just go and learn some dead languages and learn languages that nobody speaks in order to really understand what he's trying to tell you. I don't believe that either. Look, if you would, at Matt, well, stay in John. The reason why we started in John, 
Look at verse number uh, 38. Because this is really interesting, and you'll find this throughout the Bible in multiple places, and I've got a bunch of examples of these, and I'll kind of just read them off for you. But John 1, look at verse 38, the Bible says, Then Jesus turned and saw them following, and saith unto them, What seek ye? They said unto him, Rabbi, which is to say, being interpreted, Master, where dwellest thou? So in this passage, we're seeing them use a word, a word that is in another language, rabbi. Now, of course, originally, the book of John, it would make sense it was written in Greek. <coughs> what they said was not in Greek. They said a word in Hebrew. So what he does then is he says, they put in parentheses, which is to say being interpreted, ter interpreted, that word rabbi means master. Where dwellest thou? And we're reading this all in English. So we've gone through multiple translations already. But first of all, that's why I point out, there's that word interpreted, right? And it's telling you what, what a word in one language means to another. They don't use the word translate which being translated is master. No, they say which being interpreted. This is the meaning of that word. It means master. And that's why when Jesus said, you know, be not ye called rabbi, be not ye called master, be not ye called father. He says one is your rabbi, one is your master, one is your father. And these words were synonymous, but he says, I don't want you to be called the Hebrew word or the Greek word. You know, I don't want you to be called any of these words that mean rabbi or master or father because there's only one. Look at verse 41 of John 1. We see another example. The Bible says, He first findeth his own brother, brother Simon and saith unto him, We have found the Messiah, which is being interpreted the Christ. So that word Messiah just simply means Christ. So Jesus Christ is Jesus Messiah, just depending on which language you're using. But those words mean exactly the same thing. He gives us the interpretation. And then in verse 42, he does the same thing again. And he brought him to Jesus. And when Jesus beheld him, he said, Thou art Simon, the son of Jonah. Thou shalt be called Cephas, which is by interpretation a stone. So he renames Peter. And he says, Okay, Simon, I'm going to call you Cephas. And Cephas means a stone. That's what it means. That's the interpretation of it. We see the same thing of an interpretation given for uh, Jesus Christ in Matthew chapter 1. The Bible says, Now all this was done that it might be fulfilled which was spoken of the Lord by the prophet, saying, Behold, a virgin shall be with child and shall bring forth a son, and thou sh they shall call his name Emmanuel, which being interpreted is God with us. So he's quoting the Old Testament in Greek. You know, who's, Matthew is speaking again to Greek people. The letter was written so that people reading Greek and, and understanding Greek could understand. He's quoting the Old Testament, which was written in Hebrew, but he's writing it in Greek. So he says, Behold, a virgin shall be with child and shall bring forth a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel. Well, that, war, that name, Emmanuel, carries meaning. And just like all the names in the Bible carry a meaning. There's a significance to names. They all mean something. So he's going to explain what that means because this is a Hebrew name. And he's explaining to those um, speaking Greek, he says, which being interpreted is God with us. So that name, Emmanuel, literally means God with us. So something that they were not able to understand inherently because it was something that only if you knew that language you could understand it was relayed and transmitted as to what it actually meant. And you'll find this all throughout the Bible when there's anything of importance that you would need to know specifically about that language, they're going to tell you the interpretation of it. Say, well, actually, this means this. Messiah means Christ. Emmanuel means God with us. And there's a ton of examples. I'm going to read through a few of them for you. In Mark 5, 41, the Bible reads, And he took the damsel by the hand and said unto her, Talitha cumim. So they're recording the exact words that Jesus used. And what, the reason why they're doing this and say, well, why, why isn't that in English? I mean, we're reading an English translation. Why didn't they just translate Talitha Cumim? Because they're making a point here that this is exactly what Jesus said. He said Talitha Cumim. 
and he was, which means he was, he was speaking a different language when he spake this. So it's then what he would commonly be speaking. It says, which is being interpreted, damsel, I say unto thee, arise. This was something that from my understanding and from my research, what I understand is that this was, this Talithacumai is in um, Syriac or Aramaic, excuse me, which is basically a, a, a form of Syriac. It's, a, it's this Aramaic language. And we see here the meaning of this Aramaic sentence, Talithacumai, is given in Greek, being interpreted, but then for us, we're reading in English, right? It's already been interpreted again so that we could understand the meaning of these words. And that's just amazing how God works that way and his word truly is not bound by any one language or interpretation. We, could, we can see all these things and God will give us the, um, the understanding that we need depending on what language it's in already contained in the Bible. Or when Jesus Christ was up on the cross, what do you say? Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani. Again, another foreign language has made its way in and retained that sentence in the Bible. And another reason why I believe God's doing this is to let us know that we can trust that, it, it, that languages can be interpreted without um, having to worry about the original language because he doesn't just leave it at that and say, well, we're just going to leave this Eloi, Eloi, Lama, Sabachthani because there's no way of interpreting this in another language. So we're just going to leave that there because there, it doesn't have any words. We, we, can't, we can't exactly say what this means. No, he leaves that in there, but then he says, which is being interpreted, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? I would trust that if there was anything that we needed to know the only, you know, the only way to understand it is in that language, they wouldn't translate it. They would just say, well, that's what it is. You have to understand that in order to, to get it. You, I mean, how could you translate something if there's no way to translate it? <clears throat> Some more examples. Well, I'm not going to go through all these examples just for sake of time. There's a, there's a lot of them in the Bible where the Bible says... You know, go wash in the pool of Siloam, which being interpretation, which the, is by interpretation sent. Um, the apostles, it says, and Joseph, who by the apostles was surnamed Barnabas, which is being interpreted the son of consolation. They gave us the meaning of his name. Um, now there was a Joppa, a certain disciple named Tabitha, which by interpretation is called Dorcas. And Elymas, the sorcerer, for so is his name by interpretation, withstood them. So there's many places where the Bible is saying this is the interpretation. This is what that name is in this language. This is what it means in this language. Now, <clears throat> I think Daniel chapter 5 is a great example of interpreting a foreign language. And what's really interesting about Daniel chapter 5 is this possibly could even be an angelic language. Um, you remember in, in 1 Corinthians, you know, there's a lot of charismatics that believe, you know, in this speaking in tongues thing where they, they spit off all kinds of nonsense words that don't mean anything to anybody. And they'll say that they're speaking in a holy language, an angelic language, and they're trying to look spiritual and trying to claim that it's a, a, this gift of God, which, and I, I preach an entire sermon about this, about why it's not right, and not, not scriptural, not biblical, what they do. But this, I think, might actually be an angelic language. You know, the Apostle Paul said in 1 Corinthians uh, 13, though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels and have not charity, I have nothing. He says, you know, I could speak with a man's language or an, an, uh, even a, an angel language. He says, but of course I need charity. But he's referring to an angelic language. Now, in Daniel chapter 5, we see, if you remember the, the story of uh, Nebuchadnezzar's son that was, that was reigning while Nebuchadnezzar had gone crazy, or after that, and they were having this big party, and they brought in the vessels of the house of God because they were taken captive, and they start drinking it up, boozing it up, and using all the, the holy vessels of the Lord because they had no regard for the Lord whatsoever and they were throwing this big party and all of a sudden they see a, the form of a hand. They're all sitting around and they just see this hand appear and writes on the wall. 
and it, the Bible says that they were so scared that like his knees were literally shaking together and you know banging against each other because he was so afraid he was trembling so much to just see this hand appear and write on the wall well nobody none of none of his his wisest people were able to read what was written on that wall they couldn't read the language they didn't understand it they didn't know what it meant which is one of the reasons why I think, well, maybe it was an angelic language. I mean, here we have a supernatural hand showing up and writing on the wall. And it's not a language that anybody recognizes and is able to speak. But of course, Daniel's able to interpret it. Daniel's able to read it and to understand what it means. Now, the Bible says that one of the spiritual gifts is interpretation and being able to interpret things. So I believe that, that Daniel had that. And... Um, I'll just read for you from Daniel 5, verse 25. He's giving the explanation. He says, And this is the writing that was written, Mini, mini, tikel you farsin. This is the interpretation of the thing. Mini, God hath numbered thy kingdom and finished it. Tikel, thou art weighed in the balances and art found wanting. Perez, thy kingdom is divided and given to the Medes and Persians. Now, notice also, there was only four words that were written on the wall. Meanie, meanie. So that's one word, really, just, just put on there twice. Tikel Eupharsin. But look at all the words that he needed in order to explain what it meant. Meanie, God hath numbered thy kingdom and finished it. That is the, the explanation, the understanding of what meanie means. There's not a one-to-one -one word that he used to give the meaning of that word meanie. But this is scripture. And this is Daniel giving this. This word is true. The interpretation he gave is exactly 100% right. And this is the message that was given to that king. This is a message from God using mini, mini, tiga, eupharsin that God was conveying to him. But Daniel interpreted it. And it's still the same message given in an under, a language that he could understand. And none of the meaning, I believe, here is lost at all. <coughs> Daniel says, this is what it means. This is, this is the interpretation. This is what it means. God hath numbered thy kingdom and finished it. Thou art weighed in the balances and found wanting. Thy kingdom is divided and given to the Medes and Persians. <laughs> now, I was alluding to this already. Turn, if you would, to 1 Corinthians chapter 12. We're going to look a little bit at spiritual gifts also while we're on this subject. Because it is important. And, um, you know, my claim is that God is using men to interpret the Bible to keep his word preserved throughout all generations from one language to another to another to another so people can hear and understand God's word. It makes sense that one of the spiritual gifts that he gives is interpretation so that men can convert and convey his his message his word from one language to another look at verse number 10 of 1 Corinthians chapter 12 well we'll just look at um, look at verse number 8 I'll start there for to one is given by the spirit the word of wisdom to another the word of knowledge by the same spirit verse 9 to another faith by the same spirit to another the gifts of healing by the same spirit to another the working of miracles, to another prophecy, to another discerning of spirits, to another diverse kinds of tongues, different types of languages, to speak, to another the interpretation of tongues. Being able to interpret languages and convey the same, the same meaning. It's a spiritual gift. Verse 11, but all these work at that one and the selfsame spirit, dividing every man severally as he will. So if God's given someone an ability... To do an interpretation, it's obviously for his purpose and for the benefit of being able to, to convey the same exact message that God has for everybody, his words to all languages. And um, flip over, if you would, to chapter 14. <coughs> we see here some of the rules that were given to, um, to the church about people who were speaking in foreign languages, speaking with other tongues, right? Especially at this time, there were people that were able to speak in other tongues, either whether it be 
supernaturally because God has given them this gift as it was in Acts chapter 2 and I'm going to get into Acts chapter 2 in just a minute where people were able to speak languages they didn't know because the Holy Spirit came upon them and they were able to miraculously speak another language that they didn't know or whether it's because someone didn't speak the language of the land they were in but they were saved and they had something that they wanted to say and they wanted to preach to the people but they only knew their own language this is one of the rules that he gave. He's saying, look, if someone comes to you and they want to preach, they want to prophesy, but they speak a different language, well, someone needs to interpret for the rest of the people sitting there to, to give the meaning and the explanation of what he's saying, to let them know the words that he's saying in their own language. Uh, verse 5 of chapter 14 says, I would that ye all spake with tongues. Tongues meaning a language. But rather that ye prophesied, for greater is he that prophesied than he that speaketh with tongues, except he interpret that the church may receive edifying. So he's talking about a person that speaks in tongues. He's like, look, I'd rather that you just were able to preach in, the, in your normal language than to speak with another language. But if you're speaking another language, you need to be able to interpret it that the church may receive the edifying. The church needs to be benefited in order to understand, you know, by understanding it in their own language. Jump down to verse 27. And honestly, 1 Corinthians 14 just kind of completely shows how unscriptural these Pentecostal churches are that are, that are you know, believe in this tongue speaking that they, that they think is scriptural. Because when you read this and you read all of the, the rules that he says that need to be followed, and he says, look, if someone comes in and everyone's speaking in tongues, they're going to think you're crazy. The word they use is mad. They're going to think you're crazy. They're going to walk in and be like, what's wrong with these people? Because everybody's just speaking different languages and stuff. It's confusion. And they're going to leave just thinking you're nuts. And that's what goes on in, in the vast majority of these Pentecostal churches that do the tongue speaking. You have people just sitting in the pews and stuff, and they start, ah, la, 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 and they'll say, hey, praise the Lord, there's so-and-so speaking in tongues. But it's confusion. No one knows what's going on, and these people just pop up across the, the, the auditorium and just start speaking and stuff, which is not according to 1 Corinthians 15 whatsoever, or 14, excuse me. The Bible says in verse 27, if any man speak in an unknown tongue... Let it be by two, or at the most, by three, and that by course, and let one interpret. Now that word unknown doesn't mean that nobody in the whole world understands the tongue or the language, but it's unknown because, let's say, who here can speak Chinese? Anybody? Okay, that's an unknown tongue. That's an unknown language to everybody here. If I were able to speak Chinese and, and preach a sermon in Chinese, and maybe I didn't know English. I'm not supposed to just get up and preach in an unknown tongue unless somebody's here to interpret. And someone like Brother Sebastian maybe could say, oh, you know what? I speak Chinese and English. So I could preach my sermon in Chinese and he could just stand up and be like, giving the exact interpretation of what I'm saying. It makes perfect sense. And this happens in many churches. I mean, out on the mission field, sometimes you'll have people that can only speak English will go out and visit other countries but they can't speak the native language. So what they'll do is they'll have another person up that's able to speak another language. Or even in other countries, you'll have um, countries where uh, you know, half the population speaks one language and half speaks another. Right? Maybe, maybe there's a strong German influence, but not everyone speaks German. They speak you know, whatever, some other language. Russian, maybe. You, know, you might find those two languages. And... Um, churches and areas like that, then you could have an interpreter say, well, everybody can understand this now. But the Bible says in verse 28, because first it says in verse 27, now look, you could have two or three people go up and have one person do the interpreting. One person just saying what they're saying. And verse 28 says, but if there be no interpreter, if there's nobody that understands that language, let him keep silence in the church and let him speak to himself and to God. He's saying there's no benefit to it because the whole point of coming into church and preaching is to edify those that come, edify the believers, edify the body of Christ. And if no one can understand what you're saying, there's nobody to, to, to give the meaning, the interpretation, and there's no point in getting up and saying anything. So these people who think they're speaking in angelic languages and there's, that doesn't, that doesn't benefit anybody. 
And it's silly. You're right to smile and to laugh and giggle at that because it's ridiculous. It doesn't make any sense for people to do that. And then sometimes you see, oh, someone says, oh, they're saying this, and they're just making stuff up. They don't know what that language, because they don't know the language. They say, oh, I've got the gift of interpretation, and they have no idea what they're saying, and they're literally just lying and making stuff up. How much time have I got left? A little bit of time. Just one more point. Turn, if you would, to Acts chapter 2, because I said I wanted to cover the, the day of Pentecost. Because this, this ties in perfectly with, with things being lost in translation, or can they even be lost in translation? When it comes to God's Word, I think God's Word transcends all languages. We know that, that God is the one who, who even created multiple languages. When you go back to this, the story of the Tower of Babel, after Noah got off the ark and men began to multiply on the earth, well, God had told them to basically go out and, and create nations and spread out and fill the earth. But men didn't listen to that instruction. They said, no, we all kind of want to hang out together and stay in one place. So what they started doing was they wanted to build this great tower, this tower that could reach up to heaven. Basically, they wanted to, you know, it's a picture of them working their way to heaven. The own works of their hands, building their own way to heaven. This is what happens when, when, man, when men get together and all join together in one cause. God has never been for one world government. God has always instituted different nations. So what he did at the Tower of Babel was he said, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put a stop to this. I don't want all these people joined together and yoked up and, and all communicating with each other because look at what happens. When they put all their minds together, they're doing these wicked things, trying to build their way to heaven. So he confounded their language. He made it so that one day they all woke up and they go, okay, we're ready to go to work. And the people aren't able to understand each other at all because they're just completely speaking different languages. So one person speaking one language, the other guy saying, what in the world are you saying? And they can't understand each other at all. But there were some people that, you know, he made it where he split it up so that, you know, the people were able to group themselves together. Oh, yeah, we're speaking the same language. And they were all able to then go off and form their own nations as God had intended it to be. <coughs> but if God's the one who even gave them this knowledge of these languages that they didn't have before. No one knew these languages before because there was only one language. If God created that, wouldn't you think that God made it in a way so that they can all still understand His Word? Do you think God would like damn people in a way that say, well, you can't really understand my Word because you speak this language that I gave to you? Again, that's not the God that I worship and serve. He knows the language. He knows they were able to convey the same meaning and, and still have God's word in every language. God's word is life. They are living words. Jesus Christ is the word of God made flesh. Just as much as you need to believe on Jesus Christ to be saved, you need to believe God's word to be saved because they're one and the same. Jesus is the word. Jesus is sinless and perfect just as much as God's words are perfect and without error. Now, this concept, though, of, of God's word being living words and, well, you can convey the same meaning in other languages, people kind of take this a little bit too far and thinking that you could all, you could, all you have to do is to convey the meaning without actually using God's word. So like in English, people will, will say, oh, I don't, I don't you know, give the gospel by using the Bible. I just kind of give an explanation of what happened. That's not good enough because now you're, all, you're just using all of your own words. So if you were just to explain to someone, to say, yeah, Jesus died and, and rose again for your sins and you try to give your best explanation of what happened, there's going to be no power in that because the power is in God's word. We need to use God's word. The Bible says, faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. 
Now, we use our words to help people get a better understanding of God's Word. That's what I'm doing tonight. I'm preaching. We're reading Scripture because this is what's important is what we find in Scripture. But I'm trying to help give a better understanding of these words. But ultimately, it's God's Word where the truth lies. This is where the actual truth is. This is where the life resides, is in God's Word. So the life that someone needs to receive to be born again, that seed comes from God's Word. We help people to understand that, to receive it, but ultimately you cannot get people saved without God's Word. You have to use Scripture. You're in Acts chapter 2. Let's read this real quick. I'm almost done. I'm going to wrap it up with this. We're going to read this account of what happened on the day of Pentecost. And this is where Pentecostals get their name, right? The day of Pentecost. They call themselves Pentecostals because they think that um, what God had given unto his disciples here at this time is still fully engaged today and that people are doing these things, but they have a weird understanding of what this actually meant. <coughs> if we read it, we'll see the clear meaning. Acts chapter 2, look at verse number 3. The Bible says, And there appeared unto them cloven tongues like as of fire, and it sat upon each of them. So we see right off the bat, this is a supernatural event that's happening, obviously. These, these split tongues, the cloven means it's split. You know, like a snake's tongue is split at the ends. That's what cloven means. So they had these cloven tongues that were resting on them. It says that were like as a fire. They looked like they were on fire, these flaming tongues. And it sat upon each of them, and they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. So as soon as these tongues appeared, they, they started to, to speak with other tongues. And the word tongues just literally means language. They started to speak with other languages. And it says in verse 5, it continues to explain this event. Well, what does that mean? They say they started to speak with other tongues. And there were dwelling at Jerusalem Jews, devout men out of every nation under heaven. Now we start to see why this even happened. Because in Jerusalem where they were, there were people there from all over the world. Every nation under heaven were all gathered in one place. How better to distribute the word of God than to have everybody in one place. You say, yeah, they're from all over the place and they're all here, but what can we do? I don't understand this Icelandic language. I don't understand these people that live in South Africa. I don't understand the, the language of these people who live all the way out in the east. But they didn't need to know them because God gave them this supernatural ability to speak a language that they didn't know. Let's keep reading here. Verse number six. Now when this was noised abroad, the multitude came together and were confounded. That means they were confused because that every man heard them speak in his own language. So there's that word language, right? They said they were speaking with tongues. They understood in their language. A tongue just means a language. They're understanding what they said. So none of them are speaking weird languages that's an angelic language that nobody could understand. Because the people from the different areas, girls sit down, were able to understand what they were saying in their own language. Verse 7, And they were all amazed and marveled, saying one to another, Behold, are not all these which speak Galileans? They're saying they're all from here. They're all from Galilee. How in the world can they speak Chinese and Arabic and you know, what are all these different languages that they're speaking? He says in verse 8, And how hear we every man in our own tongue wherein we were born? Parthians and Medes and Elamites and dwellers in Mesopotamia and in Judea and Cappadocia and Pontus and Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia, in Egypt and in the parts of Libya about Cyrene and strangers of Rome, Jews and proselytes, Cretes and Arabians. We do hear them speak in our tongues the wonderful works of God. Now my question to you is if they're able to hear them in their own language, by people who didn't know that language but were supernatural being able to speak that, who's doing the translating? It's not the apostles. They weren't using their own wisdom to do the translating. The only thing that makes sense is, is the Holy Ghost doing the translating for them. Now, if the Holy Ghost is translating something from one language to another, do you think the Holy Ghost is making mistakes or, be, or trying to say something? Oh, the Holy Ghost, oh, sorry, I have no way of, of interpreting that. 
to this other language. You're trying to preach Jesus unto him. You're trying to preach the Bible unto him. And the Holy Ghost has to stop because, oh, this, uh, something will be lost in this translation. These poor people, I guess they just can't get saved. I guess they can't understand the word of God. I don't buy that for a second. The Holy Ghost is not screwing anything up. It, like I said, it wasn't their own knowledge that was doing this. God's Spirit was doing the translation. The same way that God can use men to translate his word or to interpret it into different languages and to retain all of the importance, use all of the exact words that need to be used to convey the message. Yes, every word is extremely important. But the words are important because they're conveying a meaning. And that meaning is related regardless of the, of the translation that you're using or the language that you speak. So I hope, and, you know, I, everyone here, I believe, you know, believes the same way that we do at our church, that we're King James only. We believe that this is the word of God in English. But you'll hear these, these um, arguments from time to time. And it's good to be able to have an answer to people that will say, oh, but what about things being lost in translation? I think Acts chapter 2 is a, is a really good place to, to kind of explain that to someone. Well, look, they're talking about here people that speak a whole bunch of different languages. Yet the Holy Ghost was able to communicate exactly what they needed to hear from God's Word to those people. And if the Holy Ghost is doing the translating, it's just as well as men speaking by the Holy Ghost and conveying God's Word to us that's without error. The Holy Ghost can communicate that and interpret it into another language. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for preserving your word for us today, that you've undertaken that task, that even though we're born in 2000, uh, well, we're not born in 2016, dear God, but even though we're living in 2016, thousands of years after um, many of, the, the, of your words were originally given unto men, we thank you being born so much later in time that you have preserved your word and that we can rely and trust your words that they are true, that we are not missing any of your words, that, that we're not um, stuck trying to figure out what's right and what's wrong and, and not really ever being able to know as, as many people who claim that believe in, in the inerrant word of God that somehow doesn't exist anymore today, dear Lord. We know it exists. We know so because you have done the translation for us. You have done the interpretation for us and have used men to do so. We thank you for providing us with, um, with the instruction in, la in language that we know. And um, it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.